In this episode, we're going to take a look at some 80s action figure vehicles that roam the land on four legs. One that takes to the skies. And one you might want to have around for your next summer cookout. So, stick around. Hello fellow dorks and dorkettes and welcome to Nostalgia Syndrome. My name is Rob. And this is the 11th installment of Raddest Rides in 80s Action Figures. This episode, we have a little bit of everything, so why don't we get right down to it with number one. Our first Rad Ride comes from a company that took advantage of a new toy line that just hit the market and was gaining in popularity. They mixed in a little bit of that Dungeons & Dragons magic that was on the toy shelves at the time. And lo and behold, you have Dragons, Knights, and Daggers, released by Imperial in 1983. Now, Imperial was known for their awesome, big, chunky, rubber-like plastic dragon figures. I think all of us at least had one floating around, and I think the most popular was the two-headed one, which came in a variety of different colors. Now, for the Dragons, Knights, and Daggers toy line, they used a lot of the same molds for those chunky dragon and monster toys that they had on the shelves. Only this time, they put them in packaging that featured so-so fantasy artwork and they weren't like the normal, you know, loose dragons that you would find on the toy shelves. They only released a few within the Dragons, Knights, and Daggers toy line, but this time we will be talking about the Attack Stallion. Now, the Attack Stallion is a black horse that is frozen in one pose. That pose is it rearing back. I mean, it's kind of cool, and it cuts an imposing, you know, figure out on the battlefield, no pun intended. But, look at this thing. How hard would it actually be to put an action figure on its back? I mean, it just looks like whomever you would saddle this horse with, they would just slide right off. Now, Imperial made some really nice dragon and monster toys like I was saying, but this attack stallion is not it. I mean, the paint applications on the face just don't look good, and I hate saying that because I like to speak positively about any toy. Now, the one positive thing I can say is it's a basic, plain horse that is to the Masters of the Universe scale, and... Yeah, that's one thing Masters of the Universe didn't have. Princess of Power did to a degree, but just plain horses. I mean, they had the big robotic horse, which was awesome, and I loved mine as a kid. But, yeah, they just didn't have any normal horses or ponies or stallions galloping around, so this might fit that little niche that Masters of the Universe was missing. Number two comes from a toy line that we've discussed in an earlier episode of Raddest Rides. And this comes from the Food Fighters toy line released by Mattel in 1988. This vehicle is the Barbecue Bomber. And honestly, with a name like Bomber, I kind of thought that we would be getting a plane of some sort. But no, this is pretty much just a, you know, portable grill with tank treads. There ain't nothing wrong with that. That's very unique and imaginative. But they could have tried just a tad bit harder. The one thing is there is no like seating or cockpit for your food fighter. They just stand there and yeah. I mean the back of the packaging actually says the grill flips up to you know provide a shield for the food fighters but yeah, I mean, they're just swinging in the breeze, you know, just riding on top of a grill. 
Now, this also featured some pretty cool things like a spatula that could launch, you know, different meats and vegetables, which the extra ammo was kept on kebab skewers, which I think that's kind of imaginative. I mean, they took the whole food, you know, atmosphere of the Food Fighters toy line, and they really doubled down. So I give them props for that. Other than having the ability to launch different meats and fruits and vegetables, the Barbecue Bomber also came equipped with hot dogs that could slide into little holding areas on the side of the grill. And I would think you could probably flick them hot dogs off and, you know, just have them screaming down the battlefield to destroy any other, you know, food fighter that happened to be in the way. And I forgot to mention that this is the evil food fighters, you know, method of transport. Now, on the front of the grill, you have something that looks just like a hunk of wood. And this is apparently a battering ram. Even though the barbecue bomber comes with a bunch of different accessories and play features, Mattel was doubling down on the battering ram function of the barbecue bomber. Now, on the back of the package, it actually states, and let me grab my phone so I don't mess this up at all, because it seems kind of crazy to me that you can launch hot dogs and has a spatula catapult to do stuff, but in big, bold letters on the back, it says... Big Bad Battering Ram Hammers Good Guys Out of Hiding. Yeah, why isn't it like, you know, chucking food or grilling up the opposition, what have you? The Battering Ram feature is what they're really selling this as? Anyway, I find that a little confusing, but I think this is pretty cool. I mean, if I definitely stumbled upon this at a flea market or something, I would buy it. I mean, I don't think I would hunt, you know, all the ends of the earth or the internet for it, but if it was in front of me for a fair price, I'd be going home with a barbecue bomber. Number three comes from a television show that I absolutely loved growing up and featured an awesome action figure toy line that, unfortunately, I was never able to get. Never had any of the figures or any of the awesome vehicles like this one. Now the TV show was the A-Team and the toys were released by Galoob in 1984. Now there were two different A-Team figures on the market. You had the normal three and three quarter G.I. Joe-esque figures which were pretty cool but kind of generic in a way. Now, what I super duper really wanted were the bigger figures that looked more screen accurate to the characters. Now, the vehicle is the Combat Attack Gyrocopter, and it came packaged with a Murdoch figure. I mean, once you've made the sale, just stop selling, because you have me. But, this also has, you know, playable features like, you know, real working rotor. I mean, that's a given for pretty much any helicopter toy. But it also had a, you know, release mechanism to drop bombs. Super cool. Now, the one thing that I think is super, super, you know, rad about this ride is that this looks like something that the A-Team would have cobbled together for Murdoch to take to the skies. And... I know they definitely did in an episode, I just can't vividly recall which one or the premise of it. I mean, they were saving people. That was the premise of every episode. I mean, what more do you need? But to have, you know, a Murdoch figure with, you know, this gyrocopter that looks very screen accurate, I mean, that's pretty awesome. And believe me, Take my money, this is definitely something I would love to have, and maybe in the future I'll, you know, do a search for them. Now, I think I talked about the A-Team figures in the past in toys that I wish I had as a kid, but I don't think I did the hunting, you know, section of that episode. 
So maybe one day we'll get back to that and see how much these go for online. Anyway, yeah, this is awesome. Number four comes stomping across the battlefield straight from the Ice Age. It is a woolly mammoth. Yes, a rideable woolly mammoth to the scale of Masters of the Universe. It was released by Sun Gold in 1987 and was part of the Galaxy Warriors toy line. Now, Sun Gold had a very strong reputation for taking a lot of inspiration from Masters of the Universe, albeit in a more cheaper form. Cheaper as in not well made, but chock full of imagination. So they get major points for that. Now, the Woolly Mammoth came packaged with a figure, and it kind of throws me off because he came packaged with Dino Man, part of the Galaxy Warriors toy line. Now, Dino Man, I mean, pretty cool. I'm down for any figure that, you know, is bestial with an animal head and stuff like that. But it just, you know, kind of doesn't sit easy with me that they are from two totally different prehistoric eras, and I don't think that jives, but that's just me. Anyway, the Mammoth is, for all intensive purposes, just a big plastic dinosaur toy that you can, you know, set a figure on top of. There's nothing wrong with that. I mean, like I said, stomping across the battlefield, I could see that laid out, you know, in my living room, my He-Man figures just there chilling, and then, you know, all of a sudden this, you know, prehistoric pachyderm is, you know, just stomping across the battlefield, crushing whomever is in their way. So, at the end of the day, it's very simplistic, but has a lot of fun potential. But the one thing I do want to point out is the packaging. Yeah, it kind of, you know, it's Frank Frazetta artwork. Even the logo of Galaxy Warriors at the top is from a Frank Frazetta painting. Now, the artwork down at the bottom is from a famous Frank Frazetta Conan picture. So, Again, with Sun Gold's reputation, I know they're not paying out royalties, and yeah, they changed it in just the slightest of ways, but I mean, shame on you, Sun Gold, for ripping off the king, Frank Frazetta. You should have given my man a few dollars. I mean, come on. I mean, I'm still going to be playing with the Galaxy Warrior figures if I ever find any, but I might not feel that great about it. Number five comes from a toy line that had so much potential. I mean, everything from the designs by Wayne Barlow to great action features that you didn't see in any other action figures at the time. It could have gone so well. And yeah, some of the most awesome, you know, accessories, figures, vehicles, play sets that I have ever seen. And, of course, I didn't have any of them. Maybe that was part of the problem. I mean, my parents just never got them for me, and I'm sure there were thousands of other kids that wanted them and never got them, and it just sunk the company. So thanks so much, parents, for killing Ravel's Power Lords toy line that was released in 1982. Now, they had a handful of really great vehicles, but we'll be talking about the Power Patroller. Now, this motorized, like, battle sled was pretty cool. I mean, first, right off the bat, it's motorized. In 1982, wow, that's groundbreaking. I mean, it had a cannon on the front, and it fired safe missiles off the back. It had a compartment for the batteries, and like an empty compartment on the other side that you could probably stick extra weapons and stuff into. I don't know. I haven't been able to find a ton of, you know, pictures of it, but that's what I would do if I had one of these as a kid. But the, you know, Power Patroller is pretty much a sled, and 
the artwork on the packaging, which is awesome, by the way, makes it kind of look like it's either going through snow or maybe, you know, a lunar surface with dust kicking up. And that picture alone just, you know, fuels my imagination at how cool this vehicle was. I mean, it doesn't have a seat per se, but it's a sled. And if you look at the packaging, it looks like, you know, you could pose you know, one of your Power Lords figures to be kind of crouched behind, you know, the, you know, handlebars of this Power Patroller. It's very cool. It's it's a reddish orange, which is really eye-catching. And, I mean, it's got a gun on the front. Awesome. And a missile-firing cannon on the back. Double awesome. So, very cool. I would love to get some Power Lords figures. I know there was a revival of it a few years ago with some really nice collector's figures, but definitely out of my price range. But they did some really neat stuff with that, you know, more modern version of the toys. Anyway, I hope one day I'll stumble upon some Power Lords figures at a fair price. But until then, I'll just, you know, try to remember that I could have had a ton of fun if it wasn't for my parents. Anyway, folks, thank you so much for watching five radical rides in 80s action figures. Like I said, this is the 11th installment of this series, and there are hundreds more awesome vehicles from the 80s just waiting to make their appearance. I mean, I'm actually going back and redoing my list, and I'm finding new stuff to add to it. The 80s were a wild, beautiful, and magical time. You are not seeing vehicles for toy lines like that nowadays, and it's pretty darn sad. But we can look back at these awesome ones that came out in the 80s and, yeah, just bask in the glow of the just radicalness. Anyway, thank you so much for watching. And if you did enjoy this episode, give me a thumbs up. If you got something to say, please leave a comment. I love reading them, and I love getting back to everybody. And if you're new around here and you enjoyed this or any of the episodes that YouTube is recommending down here, please hit subscribe. And if you hit that little bell icon, you will be notified whenever there's a new episode. So anyway, until next time, thank you so much for watching. Keep being rad and stay dorky.